And what he's done for others, he'll do for you. Isn't that a wonderful and blessed thought? I invite you, please, to take your Bible and go with me again to the book of Malachi, the book of Malachi chapter number three, and then James chapter number one, if you'll find those two places in the scriptures, Malachi chapter three and James chapter one. I began preaching a message this morning on the subject, some things never changed. I preached my first sermon as the pastor of our church on November the 2nd, 1997. We were in the Cox Chapel that Sunday morning, and I preached this same subject, no, some things never change. We were at that point undergoing only the fourth pastoral transition that our church had known and experienced at, in its 49 years of history at uh, that moment. Uh, our pastor emeritus, Dr. Randy Cox, had been our pastor from October of 73 through October of, se- of 97, and uh, his pastorate was almost one half of our church's existence at that moment. He had pastored us for 24 of our 49 years, and uh, now has been my privilege and blessed privilege to be your pastor for 25 years. And over these 25 years, we've seen many changes in our country and in our culture. We've been inundated with a call for change, really, Uh, so much so that I have likened us to the nation of Israel in the day of Isaiah. In the fifth chapter of Isaiah's prophecy in verse number 20, he said of that nation that they called evil good and good evil. They put darkness for light and light for darkness. They called uh, put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. But I'm glad in the midst of the double talk of our society, I'm glad there's a sure and true voice. And it's God's voice that still speaks clearly and plainly, distinctly and truthfully about who we are and who he is. And so we began this morning and we looked at three realities this morning. Number one, we looked at the person of God never changes. He is the great I am. He is the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We look second at all the promises of God. Those promises are found in the Bible, his blessed book. A promise of his presence in Hebrews 13, 5, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. The promise of his protection in Hebrews 13, 6, the Lord's my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. The promise of his direction Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And then we saw this morning his provision. The greatest of all was his son, but God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so tonight, if you have found Malachi chapter 3 and James chapter 1, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 6 reads, For I am the Lord, I change not. And then in the book of James chapter 1, in the 17th verse, we find these words, Every good gift. And every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. There's no change in our God. He is always and forever the same. God helping us tonight, I want us to look at three more unchanging realities in our changing world as we think about some things never change. Would you pray with me, please? Father, I pray this evening you'll take your word, you'll make application in our hearts, you'll challenge our lives tonight through the scriptures, and I pray most of all you will help every one of us as we leave this building tonight to be dedicated and consecrated to those things that never, ever change. We're glad, God, you're the same. We're glad you're dependable. We're thankful that you're faithful. And so help us, I pray, in Jesus' precious name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Number four, the people of God never change. Isn't it interesting that when God introduces man into his history of his creation, 
He does so on the sixth and final day of that creative week. He makes mankind his greatest and most climatic creation as he takes uh, from the dust of the ground, he forms a man and breathes into his nostrils the breath of life and makes him a ever living, never dying soul. You say, why did God do that? God did that for one reason. Because God wanted a people to fellowship with. God desired that there would be someone that he could share with and he could experience together his wonderful creation. But you and I know that there came a day and there came an hour when Adam and Eve transgressed the only prohibition God had given them. God had told them that they could eat of every tree in the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he told them in that day they would surely die. And you know the story. Eve took of that fruit and did eat, and her husband also ate with her. That very day, I'm not sure it was very much, uh, very long after that transgression, God came down in the cool of the day like he had done every day before because he had created them so that they could fellowship together. He came down in the cool of the day that day and he cried out and he said, Adam, where art thou? God wasn't doing that for information. God knew where they were. God was doing that for instruction. You know what God was doing? God was making an invitation that Adam and Eve could return to fellowship with him. Aren't you glad that God has always had a people? You, you can fast forward from the third chapter of the book of Genesis and go to chapter number six, and you find out that evil was present everywhere. But there's a statement made in, the, in Genesis six and verse number eight, but Noah found grace in the eyes of of the Lord. It is a wonderful thing that God, though he was about to judge the whole earth, though he was about to bring destruction upon that which he had created, he reached down and he found a man and his wife and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their three wives, and he got them to prepare an ark, and he put them inside the ark, and he closed the door, and he protected them from the destruction. Why did God do that? God did that because God is always one of the people for his name's sake. You, you fast forward just a few years from there to the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis and you find God go down into a pagan land to the Ur of the Chaldees and he says to one man who has faith in him, if you'll come and follow me, I'm going to take you to a place you don't know. I'm going to bring you to that place. I'm going to bless you in that place. I'm going to give you that place and I'm going to give that place to your people forever. Why? Because God wants a people to fellowship with. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament, the book of Acts, is preaching in the synagogue. And he says God's calling out a people for his namesake from the Gentiles. Aren't you, aren't you glad this, this evening that it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile? It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It, it doesn't matter if you're educated or illiterate. It doesn't matter who you are or where you're from. Aren't you glad that God has called out a people for his name? It's interesting to me, you get to the last book of the whole Bible. You get almost to the last verse in the whole Bible. And you find these words in chapter 22 and verse 17 of the Revelation. And the spirit and the bride say come. And let him that heareth say come. And whosoever will, let him come and take the water of life freely. You know, God closes out all the Bible. But saying, you know what? I want a people for my name's sake. I want a people that I may fellowship together with them. And the good news about God's people never changes. You only come to God one way. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is 
and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. You and I came in the same way. Nobody came in a special way. Nobody came in a different way. Everyone who's come into relationship with God has come into relationship through faith in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the people of God never change. They may change faces. They may speak different languages. They may be from different places. They, they may not know the same, know each other, but, but the reality is they know him. And, and I've said it so many times in these years, but, but the truth is, apart from Jesus Christ, most of us in this auditorium, we'd have lived and died and never met each other. We'd have never known each other. But because we heard the invitation of God, come unto me all you that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly. Because we accepted his invitation, we became a part of his people. And the wonderful news tonight is the people of God never change. God's people are always people who come to him through and by faith. Number five, the power of of God never changes. Did you know God has never had a weak moment? God, God's never had a despairing thought. God, God is always the same and, and his power. How's that power known in our lives tonight? That power is known in our lives through the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. The Holy Spirit, at the moment you and I trusted Christ as our Savior, baptized us into the body of Christ. He indwells our bodies tonight and lives in us. Romans 8 and verse 9, but ye are not in the flesh. But in the Spirit, if so be the Spirit of Christ dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if, the, if Christ be in you, the body's dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. The reality is tonight, if you're saved and part of the people of God, then the power of God lives on the inside of your body. <laughs> but you know what? The Holy Spirit doesn't want to just be a resident. The Holy Spirit wants to be the president. He doesn't want to just indwell you. He wants to empower you. He wants to be in control of you. He wants to be in control of me. He wants us to yield ourselves to him. Ephesians 5, 8, and be not drunk with wine, where's in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Why, why does God put the power of the Holy Spirit in us? Can I give you three things tonight? I believe that the power of God wants to do in every one of our lives. First of all, he wants to make you a blessing. Would you go with me, please, to the Gospel of John? Gospel of John, chapter number 7, if you will, please. He wants to make you a blessing. You're in John's Gospel, chapter 7. Would you look with me at verse number 38? Verse 38, he says, He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39 is a parenthetical thought. But this he spake of the Spirit which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus is speaking and he says, when, when, when I'm left here, when I've gone, John inserts that thought, when he has been glorified, when he's died, when he's been buried, when he's risen again, when he's ascended to heaven and, and has assumed his rightful place at the right hand of the throne on high, then the Holy Spirit is going to come in to the life of the believer and he comes in so that out of us would flow rivers of living water. You know, God wants every one of us to be a blessing to somebody else. Nothing we have received have we received so that we become a reservoir. Everything we've received from God, we've received from God so that we can be a conduit. God wants to flow into us, but he doesn't want to stay in us. He wants to flow out of us into the lives of the people that God puts in our lives. 
God wants you and I to be an or, uh, artesian well, overflowing. Can I ask you a question? Are you a reservoir or a river? What are you? God intended for us to be a blessing. And so that's the reason the power of God dwells in us. Let me go just a few pages. Fast forward in your Bible to the book of Acts. I'll show you the second person, a second reason that the person of the Holy Spirit lives in us. Go to Acts chapter 1, would you please? Acts chapter 1. Would you look there at the 8th verse, please? Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8. It says, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Number one reason the power of God rests in us and dwells in us is to make us a blessing. Number two is to make us a bold witness. God wants you and I to be his mouthpiece. God wants you and I to be his witness. What is a witness? A witness is simply someone who tells what they know to be true. Well, listen to me. I know to be true tonight that every man's a sinner. I, I know to be true tonight that, that every man, if they get what they deserve, they get judgment and hell from separation from God forever. I know that, that every man can be saved because Jesus died on the cross, was buried and rose again. And I know that every person who will believe on him, he'll receive them into his own family. So what I know tonight, I'm supposed to be telling I'm supposed to be sharing it with someone. I, I'm supposed to be testifying of the grace of God in my life. And you're to be doing that in your life. We are his witnesses. It doesn't say you might be my witnesses. He said you'll receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses. We emphasize that word shall when we talk about for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, listen, as much as the shall be saved, the shall be witnesses is part of what God wants to do on this planet. And the Holy Spirit lives in us tonight to make us a bold witness. If you and I are not witnessing on a regular basis for Jesus Christ, I'll tell you it's not God's fault. It's our fault. And I'm, I'm afraid one of the things that happened through the pandemic was we, we kind of lost our passion for soul winning as a church. I'm just, just me and you here tonight, all right? I think we just kind of stepped back and, and you know, it's, it's okay if I go, it's okay if I don't go. No, I'm going to tell you what, there, there's not a reason why none of a, any of us ought not to have a gospel track on our person at all times so we can share it with anybody that we run into. Well, yeah, I know, but people... No, people ain't scared to take the track. You're scared to give it to them. You, you can blame it on somebody else if you want to, but the problem is, it, 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 hey, listen to me. Yeah, I, I like what Curtis Hudson said. Yeah, there's only two types of Christians, a soul winner and a backslider. See, we got the power. It ain't, it ain't a problem with, with the power. The power's in us. Uh, you, you just fast forward. Go right here. You're in Acts. Go to chapter 4. Would you go there just a moment? Chapter 4. Look at verse 31. Verse 31. It says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. What happened? Because they were filled with the Spirit. When they were empowered with the Spirit. When, when, when they were enabled with the Spirit. When they were controlled by the Spirit. That's what the word filled means. They spake the Word of God with boldness. They weren't ashamed. Have you noticed the LBGTQ plus several of the alphabet? They're not embarrassed to talk about what they believe. They're not, they're not afraid to protest. They're not afraid to shout. They're not afraid to scream. They're, they're not afraid to get in front of a camera. But somehow we, we, we kind of back down. Hey, listen to me. Greater is he that's in you than he's in the world. We, we don't have an excuse for not being a bold witness for Jesus Christ because the power of God never changes. God's power is not short-circuited in your life or my life unless there's sin that we won't deal with. God gave us that power to make us a blessing. God gave us that power to, to, to make us a bold witness. God gave us the power, the person, the Holy Spirit for a third reason. Would you go me to 2 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, would you please? 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. 
Look at verse 17. Verse 17 says, Now the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There's liberty to do what? Not to do what you want to do. Look at the rest of the context. Look at verse 18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, I believe that glass to be the Bible, are changed into the same image. That's the image of the glory of the Lord. From glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The Holy Spirit's given to us to make us a blessing, to make us a bold witness. Number three, to bring us into conformity to Christ. You know what the Holy Spirit wants to do? He wants to paint the likeness of Jesus in you and me. He wants people this week, wherever we go, where it's work or school or, or in our neighborhood or going shopping or whatever. You're, you, 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 you want what he wants us to do? He, he wants us to show Jesus. Do you know in Acts chapter 11 and verse 26, they were first called Christians at Antioch. Do you know why they were called Christians? It means a little Christ. It, it, it was given really as a derogatory term. These are just little Jesuses running around everywhere. Well, I'm going to tell you what this world needs is they need a bunch of little Jesuses running around this world. They, they need people like you and me who do not respond to others, whether they treat us right or treat us wrong in, in the power of our flesh, but we respond in the power of his spirit, that power that dwells in us, that power that enables us to love like Jesus loved and live like Jesus lived and to be kind and to be courteous and to be long-suffering and to be patient and to be gracious and to be merciful. I'm telling you, there's not a whole lot of problems in America that a little Jesus wouldn't help. And the only way this world's ever going to see him is through us. He's coming back, but buddy, when he comes back, he's riding on a white horse and he's taking over. Right now, he's extending grace and mercy and forgiveness and salvation, and he's doing it through us. Doing it through you. He's doing it through me. Because the power of God lives in us. And we have the liberty to not do what we want to do, but we have the liberty to be brought into the very image of Jesus Christ. That's God's mind for us. See, some things never change. The people of God never change. The power of God never changes. One last thought. The program of God never changes. Jesus is standing at Caesarea Philippi. It's a place of pagan worship in that hour. There are all kinds of gods worshipped on that hillside. Some of you have been to Israel and seen it. All kind of gods worshipped on that hillside. One of the areas right there at the foot of that mount is called the gates of hell. And Jesus says to his disciples standing there looking at the gates of hell. He said, who do men say that I am? They say, I'm Elijah, I'm John prophet he said who do you say I am Peter said a lot of things and some of them wasn't too smart but he was pretty right on that day he said thou art the Christ the son of the living God and Jesus looked at him there it's recorded in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18 he says, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, what rock? That rock of declaration, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know what God's program for the day we are living in? It's the local New Testament church. See, God doesn't just desire people, as I mentioned earlier, to fellowship together with them, but he desires a people who will carry out his program on planet Earth. 
He's chosen and allowed us as individuals saved by his grace, empowered by his spirit, to be sent forth as his witnesses into this world. And, and that program is exactly the same. But I'll go to, let's go to one recording of it. Go with me to the Gospel of Matthew, if you would please, the 28th chapter, the final chapter of Matthew's Gospel. And look with me, if you will, at the 18th verse of Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 28. Well, matter of fact, would you look up at verse 16? Verse 16. It says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power, that word power there is authority. All power, all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, therefore based on the power that's been given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. And teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. God's program is the local church, and God's commission to the local church is to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. His power, his authority is behind us. We're not going based on our own abilities tonight. There are four parts to the, the, the program God lays out here for the local church. Number one, he says go. As a matter of fact, that's a present active imperative priest uh, participle. It, it simply means as you are going. Soul winning is not something we just do on Saturday. Though we do it on Saturday at 10 o'clock, we'd love for you to meet us right out in the lobby this Saturday morning. But it's not something we just do on Saturday. It, it's not something we just do at an appointed time. Going is something we do every day. And wherever we go, God intends for us to be going with the gospel. You take the go out of the gospel and all you got is a spell. <laughs> Not much. But you put the go in the gospel and we can go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He says, number one, go. Number two, he says, teach all nations. That word nations there doesn't mean uh, people as in groups according to uh, boundary lines. It means all ethnicities of people. And the word teach there means to make disciples of all the world. You cannot disciple someone that you have not evangelized. So it begins with evangelizing. It begins with telling. It, it begins with sharing your testimony. It begins with giving the gospel. It begins with opening the Bible and explaining how someone else can be saved. But he says, teach all nations. And then he says, baptizing them. It's not enough to believe. <laughs> we are to declare that we belong to Jesus through the act of water baptism. Baptism identifies a person with both Christ and his church. And finally, he says there in verse number 20, we're to teach them to observe all things, everything. And I think primarily it goes back to what he's just said in verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. You know what God meant for us to do? God meant for us to re reproduce ourselves in other Christians, bringing them into the kingdom of God. God wants to use us. God wants to use you. God wants to use me. I believe God wants us to, to uh, reproduce ourselves in other churches. It's interesting. A while ago, we were in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The, the program of God is not just happening in Raleigh. The program of God's happening in Honduras where Brother Jose is. The, the program of God's happening in Venezuela. The, the program of God's happening in Moldova. The, the program of God's happening in, in, in countries all around the world. I thought a while ago while Brother Jose was sharing his work, and we were seeing the video, I was thinking, well, what a privilege it is to be a participate, a participant in, in the program of God. 
as of October 31st this year, you know what we've given as a church together collectively? Over $528,000 have been given in worldwide faith promise missions. God helping us, we'll, we'll, we'll make 600000 this year. We made 588000 given last year. You know how that happens? That, that's happened because you and I have understood the program of God. Not just that it involves Jerusalem, though it does start in Jerusalem. You can't start somewhere else. You, you can't be more interested in getting the gospel to Honduras or Moldova or, or wherever than you are getting it to your neighbor. Are you getting it to your coworker? But you think about what God's done over these 25 years. I remember when the pulpit committee was elected, preacher Cox announced his retirement in March of 97 on a Sunday morning. At Wednesday night, our church elected a pulpit committee. Some of those men are still sitting in this room tonight. And I remember them coming to me and saying, of course, you're the first person we want to we wanna talk to. And uh, we, we, we need to meet. And I said, yes, I want to meet. And I said, I just want to share with you a burden I have. I believe every local New Testament church is supposed to reproduce itself. Uh, planting other churches. And I sat down over in the conference room at the Cox Chapel with those men for a couple hours. One night, I think that week, it could have been the next. We sat down there, and, and I began to lay out the thing that God laid on my heart. From my understanding of Scripture, I come under conviction when I was in college through really a personal study. I never took a class on the book of Acts. I was just studying the book of Acts for myself. And I became convinced that every church was supposed to go and reproduce itself. And I said to those men, I said, I, I'll tell you what I believe God would like for us to do. I, like, I believe if God gives us life and gives us grace and mercy, we ought to plant five churches in the next 25 years. <laughs> now, I'll just be honest with you. <laughs> it was hard to imagine 25 years as a 38-year-old man, Okay. I didn't even think about being 63 myself, but I am. You know what? To God be the glory. It's not five, but six. It's the Golgotha Baptist Church in Kishino, Moldova. It's the Shield of Faith Bible Baptist Church in Yarnataco, Venezuela. It's the Beacon Baptist Church in El Progreso, Honduras. It's the Beacon Baptist Church in KNR, Moldova. It's the Truth Baptist Church in Santa Barbara, Honduras. And it's the Beacon Baptist Church in Phoenix, Arizona. Wow. What a faithful God. What a good God. That would allow me and you to have a part in his eternal program. What a wonderful day it's going to be when you and I gather around the throne of God in heaven and there are people from every tribe and every tongue and every place who are going to gather there at the throne of God and there are going to be literally thousands and millions of them who are there because you and I, we went and we prayed and we gave. Because the program of God never changes. God is the same yesterday, today, today. And forever. I'm glad tonight to report to you with absolute confidence in my heart. There are some things that never change. Those things, those things are the person of God. The promises of God. The provision of God. The people of God. The power of God. And the program. Now, it comes down to this question. Will you and I get in on God's program? Most of us would testify tonight that we're one of God's people. We've trusted Christ as our Savior. Being that, we have the Holy Spirit who lives in us. I wonder tonight, are we yielded to God's power? And are we involved in God's program? Let's bow our heads for prayer, would you please? Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. We come to the close of this Sunday, another Lord's Day. God's blessed us with as a church.